A little different video this week. Um, I'm going to narrate this one. I'd originally intended to do it while I was working on the bike, but um, with the camera mounted on my head like this is a bit of an experiment, and turns out all you can hear is me um, grunting and groaning and creaking. So you join me today taking apart the Grand Challenge bike's engine because um, it's gone from burning a bit of oil to burning a horrific amount of oil. And it got to the point where I was using about 250 milliliters in, um, I don't know, maybe 40 miles, which is a quarter of the crankcase oil. And that's not going to fly if we're going to do long distance on this bike. So I figured I'd uh, take a look and find out what's going on. You're just watching me remove the timing cover now from the top of the engine. Um, it's just a pair of screws. Worth bearing in mind, I still don't know if this bike has um, JIS or Phillips heads, but um, this trusty green screwdriver of mine seems to work well for both. The trick really is to put plenty of pressure into the screw head so that it can't um, cam out. Now I've got the timing cover off, um, you can see me kind of considering where to go next and uh, I don't remember where I went next from here but I think it's down to the covers over the timing mark um, and yep the uh, the crank I tried a few different things to get this off but someone else has already helpfully rounded it out quite badly the crank cover came off relatively easily um, these aluminium threads have a tendency to stick really tight until suddenly they pop but again, the same advice applies really, is to uh, keep plenty of pressure in them. I eventually went for the butcher's approach here, which is to um, hit it round with the head of the screwdriver and the hammer, which worked. I can always pick up another one of these covers. They're relatively cheap from the likes of Wiimoto. Just making sure here that I get the, um, the O-ring out with it and it doesn't fall into the engine. The next step here then is to undo the nut that is in the camshaft and so I'm following the guidance of the workshop manual on what order to do this in and I think the workshop manual might be slightly miswritten because I do mess up here um, when it comes to the cam chain tensioner but you can see I'm looking through the gap uh, it's on your left but it's obviously towards the uh, the top of the bike upright for the timing mark again the workshop manual here says it's a line it's actually a T um, and so once that's aligned with the little arrow that's inside this case we should be able to look up at the camshaft itself and see that the registration mark on that which I think is at about the 11 o'clock position um, if it were a clock face is in the right place and once we're there we know that the engine is in its sort of timing position this is a bit of an awkward procedure it involves getting the engine stopped by putting one ratchet on the crankshaft and then um, with the other ratchet on the camshaft nut turning them in an opposed fashion um, and as you can see here I'm kind of bouncing on them because although they're not exceptionally high torque figures they do get quite sticky over time um, and so eventually you'll see that the camshaft nut releases and now the next part here is um, in the workshop manual it says to remove the cap and then to loosen this tensioner. I think actually what you need to do is take the entire thing out. It has inside it a um, spring and a plunger that are not constrained and they have two washers on them. If you leave it in then when you take the cam chain out it releases tension and the plunger shoots forward and drops into the engine. Mind you if I'd taken it all off the way out, I don't think there would have been sufficient tension on the cam chain to keep everything together while I drew it out the side of the engine because it points slightly down into the cavity. I imagine there's quite a trick to this and once you've done it more than once it's easy to get everything apart and I'm not even entirely sure that my bike had the washers on that assembly in the first place. So I'm going to take the side cover off later just to double check and see if anything fell down there. Better safe than sorry and it's only a few screws gives me a chance to check out the state of everything under there as well pun fully intended because that's where the stator lives so you can see now that I'm just taking apart some of the ancillary stuff to give myself access I've popped the carbs off um, and now I can get my big wrench in to first loosen that cover which just screws off and then underneath is the uh, cam chain tensioner assembly it's quite an interesting one this 
it has a free floating pin which is on the end of, end of the plunger I just mentioned um, and you tighten it up until the plunger pokes out a certain amount and that plunger floats with the spoons that hold the cam chain um, and so as you're tensioning it you're putting pressure on that spring until the end of the plunger pops out and that's when you know that there's a balance between the spring and the plunger position and therefore the right amount of cam chain tension. It's very clever. So what am I doing with this big ball of string? Uh, well following the workshop manual and um, also just a bit of general uh, motorcycle sense I suppose we're about to take the cam pulley off and that means the cam chain is going to be unconstrained. Now <laughs> I know it seems silly since we're going to have to take things apart anyway but this stops the cam chain from falling all the way down into the engine and forcing you to take the side cover off. I know I said I just had to, but um, you know, in theory you don't have to. So you tie it up with a piece of string like this. Um, it's going to make life a little bit awkward because of the way I'm doing it, but I'm being overprotective here. Um, I'm going to tie this up, that way I want to take the pulley off and then latter the head. I've always got a way to retrieve that chain in case it does drop down all the way inside the engine. So I'm going to grab the wrench um, and take this bolt all the way out. You can see that I'm cupping behind it just to make sure that nothing falls down into the engine and I'm also pressing back on the um, on the cam sprocket so that it stays against the engine and attached to the registration mark or registration pin in this case. So now that that's out, um, there's a little piece of swarf in there so it looks like someone might have been a bit evil to those threads. Um, or it's never been off, you never know. But I just pop my fingers inside the holes on that sprocket. And I'm going to gently manoeuvre it off. Um, and it's a bit of a balancing act because you need to kind of manoeuvre it off. Uh, and then get the chain off of it and then get it out of the hole. I don't know if there's a better way to do this. But um, the workshop manual just says remove it. And I'm guessing it expects me to have a little more uh, knowledge of everything that's going on here than I actually do as a home basher in my garage. So I'm about to start struggling with the tensioner here. Now I'm just going based on kind of a stored memory of every cam chain or belt I've ever done and um, in my mind it was safer to have it all the way out with no tension on it than it was to completely try and remove it because you never know what the mechanism of springs inside an engine is going to be. Um, hoping that they're contained by leaving everything loosely in place is usually my go-to strategy. Most of the time it works. Um, you can actually see me here trying to figure out how this cam tensioner works. Um, what I've got is my left hand fingers are on the tensioner runner, the kind of piece of fancy plastic inside the engine. And as I'm winding that screw in and out, I'm feeling for what it does and how the spring tension changes to try and understand the mechanism before I pop the head off. You'll see in a moment that it's not going to make any difference to the fact it all goes wrong, but this is kind of a, a brilliant ethos to have and it's one that I'm quite proud of, which is whenever you're working on something like this, just trying to understand what's going on before you move forward. If you can get your hands, fingers and brain around something, um, then you can usually figure out how it goes, how it works, the thought process of the engineer that put it together um, and therefore you can sometimes save yourself some pain uh, by getting ahead of issues that might occur. I've been bent over for too long at this point so my brain is scrambled, um, just staring around the garage idly thinking what a mess it is. Don't worry, I've tidied it up now. Um, you wouldn't even recognise it and hopefully in the next video I get to show that off. But uh, we've got that sprocket out now and we're looking at the inside of the engine without the cam sprocket and with the chain hanging out so next thing we're going to do is take the head off so I've just um, jumped forward here we're taking the bracing plate off the top of the engine that holds the head to the upper arm of the frame this needs to come off so that I can get to the head bolts um, and it's one of the few pits, bits and pieces on this engine that you need to take off it's just uh, three bolts, nothing dramatic. They were quite stiff and um, you'll notice a theme here. I staunchly refuse to get a bigger wrench because it's three feet away so I'd much rather struggle and bruise my palms with a smaller wrench and a hefty dose of body weight. 
So there we go, that's those apart. And um, I'm just looking here once again to see the order of precedence. So we've got four main head bolts on this engine, and then we've got two kind of um, ancillary bolts, shall we say, that sit on the other side of the gap where the timing chain runs. You can see me popping my finger under there to see whether those bolts go all the way through, um, and then just offering up the socket to see what size they are. So what I'm going to do here probably isn't recommended. You should ideally take all six of these bolts out in pattern. Um, but I think I go for the, the major head bolts first and then the other one second because they have a different type of head. They're hexes, whereas the head bolts are, you know, standard bolts. By hexes, of course, I mean Allens. I realise they're all hexagonal if you look at them from above. First of all, though, um, one more thing to remove. We've got to pop the exhaust off. Made ever more difficult by my um, scenes to heat wrap. So just a combination of extensions there to keep my hands out of the way of the itchy, itchy fiberglass. The exhaust's manoeuvred out of the way, um, and so I'm going to attack these head bolts next. Whenever you're dealing with stressed members like a head, um, you should always tighten and untighten in an order that means that the stress is either put onto the head or taken off of the head in a way that the manufacturer recommends. Now, on a four bolt head like this, it'll usually be to loosen the opposite bolts and then the other pair of opposite bolts and to go round them in order. These only took about half a turn before the tension was completely off of them. Um, but when you put them back on, it's much more important. What this does is stops you warping the head um, by tightening things in the wrong order and kinking it, if you will. Imagine it like trying to apply a sticker. You need to um, go evenly and smoothly, push the folds and the stress and the bubbles out until you get to the edge, rather than coming in from two edges and creating a fold in the middle. That would be a head warp, and not something you'd want to do to an engine. They can be very minor. Uh, very hard to or impossible to spot with the naked eye but can cause you to blow head gaskets for a long time after um, until you give up and take it to the machine shop and they find the warp it doesn't take much especially not on uh, aluminium castings I'm just uh, assembling a weird concoction of allen head and socket here in order to get into the place that I need to to get those other two bolts off turns out they're actually tighter than the head bolts so let's just fast forward those out of the way I think quite long bolts and that's it now so enter the persuader uh, use a rubber mallet and a light knock a little bit on either side should um, free everything up I actually ended up taking the um, coil off so that I could get this out. The head bolts were loose, um, but I couldn't actually lift them out. You can't see here because there's a brake master cylinder in the way, but um, I couldn't lift them out past the coil, so that had to come off, and it was probably necessary in order to uh, get the head up and off. You can see now that I've taken out one head bolt, I'm stopping and thinking I really should have found a piece of cardboard to push this into. Top tip, it's as old as the hills, I definitely didn't invent it. Find a scrap piece of cardboard, poke some holes in the pattern of your head, um, put a mark on it to show which way is forward. So I'm going to poke six holes here eventually for all of the bolts, and then slide them into it um, and leave it somewhere where it's not going to get disturbed. That way you know where everything goes. You can see here I'm putting an arrow on to show which way is forward on the bike. That way you don't mix them up. It's important not to mix up head bolts or stressed tension bolts because they um, each take on the characteristics of wherever or however they're bolted in. So for example the two on the front closer to the exhaust port might experience stress differently due to the temperature differences versus the ones on the back of the engine near the inlet. I don't know the material science behind it but um, it's what I've been told to do so I do it. So after a bit of juggling, um, you can now see that the head just pops off and uh, I had to cut and retie those strings, but it's ready to go onto the bench. 
couldn't help but have a quick uh, peek at the valves to see if there was anything wrong going on there. Sorry, it's just gone off screen a bit. The next task, um, and this is going to be the final task, is just to get the jug off. The jug being the cylinder itself. There are another two bolts here. They're fairly easy to get out. Just going to fast forward through. Just need a long Allen bit. Um, and then we can bring back our friend the Persuader just to give this a knock. Um, break the seal on the gasket and then it just lifts off. Beware when you're doing this that there are little collars in the holes that the um, bolts go through, all the different bolts. Some of them have O-rings, some don't, but what they do all have in common is they can fall inside your engine and ruin your day. So as you're lifting up, just lift up nice and straight. Um, make sure to pick anything up that you see loose or about to fall out. Pay a lot of attention. I know it doesn't look like I am, but um, my fingers and my right hand are underneath two of those collars. Uh, while my left hand is assembling, assembling, definitely disassembling the um, left hand timing chain guide. Um, and then this is just a bit of a balancing act to lift this all off, pop the piston out, make sure it doesn't slap about and uh, smack into anything, make sure that we don't lose any bits into the engine, pull this all the way off, and then um, I'm going to have to cut this string and retie it, keep the timing chain where it is not super essential now because if you did drop it you could reach down and get it but always easier to have it constrained so that it doesn't disappear or jam up or do something weird chains have their own special branch of physics for this very reason so from here on you can't really see anything because um, i've got my head in the frame so i'll jump forward and that's the jug free so i'm going to go and shove this on the bench now um, I will show you in another video how I measured this and determined that it was horribly out of spec, but I've actually already sent it off to a machine shop to be bored, honed, and have a piston spec'd up and um, hopefully provided that will get us back running again. The reason I took this all apart first um, and didn't just look for stock parts is because I didn't know what state the engine was in. It turns out this engine's always always already at a 0.5 overbore, which means this has been done before. If I'd just gone ahead and ordered piston rings, I'd have ended up with the wrong ones. And since they're a tiny bit rare for this engine for some reason, um, that would have been 50 quid down the drain. You can just see in the video here, I'm having a, a cursory glance. And actually, uh, you probably can't see it here, but close up, you can see the cross hatchings perfect around this bore, except for the sides where the piston skirt sits, where it looks like it's been scuffed up and that follows through if you look at the piston the sides of the piston the skirt are really badly scuffed up and if you mic them out or measure them with a micrometer you can see the piston is critically undersized on the skirts it's it's worn out and needs replacing and the cylinder needs addressing so that's off at the moment with a machine shop when it gets back i'll do a bit of a demo on how i measured it and what you're looking for then we'll put it back together and we should have the grand challenge bike back and running Maybe with a bit more compression, we might be able to get more than 50 mile an hour out of it, but um, that's just being hopeful. I'll be happy when it works again, because despite having a couple of bikes to play with, I kind of miss the thing already. So uh, thanks for wrenching along with me. Let me know what you think of the change of format. I'm going to stop this footage now of me um, idly contemplating the engine and uh, go and tidy up the garage. Or at least this me was. Now me's done it. So... See you later, sucker, old me.